you got a fatty girl. Fatty girl, fatty girl, fatty girl. Welcome to the Business Grind, where we give you an inside perspective on what it takes to start, build, and run a successful business. Here are your hosts, Danny Shaw and Sean Michael Wellington. All right. Hello to everyone in podcast land. Welcome to another episode of the Business Grind. Um, happy to be here with a new episode with Sean, and we're going to get into today's topic. Sean, how you feeling today? Feeling for us and by us today. <laughs> is that how we're going to start it off? Let's do it. That's what it is, right? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So, yeah, you know, it is Hip Hop 50. You know we wasn't going to uh, let the whole year go by without doing at least a Hip Hop 50 related episode, and that is what we're doing today. Uh, and today's episode is on FUBU, yeah? Yes, sir. The clothing line <laughs> for, uh, made was, that was popular in the 90s and early 2000s, um, you know, started in hip-hop culture. For us, by us, for sure, for sure. All right, so I am I think first, I think we might need to give a little bit of the history in the background because I, while we may know it, you know, there is the possibility that people do not know for us, by us, the clothing line. As crazy as that might sound, right? I mean, we kind of old, you know? So <laughs> it's not that crazy. We're, we old heads. So. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, let me, we'll get into a little background history. Then after that, y'all got to do y'all Googles or uh, uh, more Googles, right? So it was really started in the early 90s, right? Damon John, four friends, Damon John, uh, J. Alexander Martin, Keith Perrin, and Carlton Brown, right? Um, and essentially... FUBU started on in Queens, Jamaica, around Jamaica, Queens, and became basically a global brand that was clothing brand that was intertwined with, you know, the hip-hop culture and fashion aesthetics of the time, right? Um, yeah, and it was like they were selling hats was the main, it was the first item, if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken, their first item they would sell was hats, and then they had t-shirts that they would custom make. Right, so yeah, so they initially started as hats, um, and uh, the story goes that, Damon John, who is who has over the years been the like the face of FUBU over the years, right? The main lead and spokesperson. Um, initially, he was doing other type of T-shirts, like themed T-shirts for like different events that was happening in the popular mainstream media at the time, and then transitioned into uh, some hats. Um, and once he 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 made the hats and he sold them on Jamaica Ave in front of the Coliseum Mall. Uh, once he made that eight hundred dollar profit, it was like, oh, we got something here, and then kind of just kept building upon it from there, right? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. No, you just mentioned Queens. Yeah. Um, I was, I was, uh, I forget what interview it was with him, but he was kind of talking about his his jobs before starting Fubu and mm-hmm. how he was a dollar cab driver, how he did that. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Uh, shout out! I never to, knew that. Shout out to the dollar van drivers in Queens out there. Um, and yeah, he also worked at Red Lobster as well, right? He talks about Red, his Red Lobster days a lot in a lot of his interviews, for sure. Uh, uh, okay. But I did not hear about the Dollar Van uh, one, uh, so yeah. Yeah, apparently what <laughs> made him stop was the fines. Like, so it's like he thought it was gonna be like a fifty dollar fine or like a hundred dollar fine for, cause you know, all right, I mean, do we gotta explain Dollar? I think we do. I think we gotta explain food right? yeah. We gotta explain the Dollar right. Vans. Go. <laughs> so we gotta do a slight tangent, but for <laughs> those who are not from New York, a Dollar Cab or a Dollar Van, cause they have both. Right. Um, they basically follow the bus routes, so hmm. they're an independent livery driver that follows the bus routes, but not everyone who did that had the correct paperwork it right. was kind of a, a hustle so. Uh-huh, uh-huh. um so yeah and he was saying how you know the fine for not having your paperwork was like a thousand dollars or something or like six thousand dollars something crazy so he was like yeah that wasn't for me after wow. i got the first ticket so. wow you know what I, I know we're going off on a tangent but that makes a lot of sense because you know i used to live in far rockaway and uh i used to ride the dollar vans a lot and uh it, it wasn't always the safest <laughs> to ride the vans because some drivers was definitely trying to avoid those cops and get those fines. And I was like, well, what's so serious about these fines? But yeah, I would be I would be acting that way too if I was trying to avoid a $6,000 fine every time. So, okay. In the 90s, yeah. Yeah. 6, is yeah. Right. Even today, obviously, <laughs> but yeah. That gets a lot of contact. All right, cool. So yeah, it started um, in Queens, Damon John selling the hats. Um, we're gonna fast forward, you know, to a few, to a few key moments. I think um, uh, from there, um, you know, that's when his other friends started getting involved in the business. Um, one of them was a, a, a army vet, a navy vet, excuse me, who came back 
um, from the Navy and his and had went to FIT as well. Uh, and because of his fashion experience and just knowledge and stuff, was able to kind of help uh, with Damon John as well. And then he had the other two friends, and the four of them essentially uh, created what we all come to know as FUBU, right? Uh, standing for us and by us, right? Um, yep. But then also early in the early in the company's history, you know, they're trying to get buyers and people to, to buy the merchandise and retailers. So they went to the Magic Show, right? And I don't know if people are familiar with the Magic Show. Um, Magic is a men's apparel group. I forgot what the IC stand for, uh, but um, it's essentially a convention in, in Las Vegas every year where, um, you know, multiple vendors go out there to set up booths. Uh, at this conference and basically sell their clothes to various merchandisers you know place you know i let's say i'm a i'm a clothing designer or fashion line and i'm selling orders to walmart macy's you know low end high end whoever's available i'm taking these orders and i'm showing my merch and then i'm you know making these uh, relationships as well at the magic convention um sean was you familiar with magic convention no, uh, I wasn't actually, but, you know, when I was uh, just doing the research, it seemed like it was kind of like a, just a big convention, you know, like they have, mm -hmm. you have gun shows or you have like Comic-Con mm -hmm. that are in a big uh, um, Jacob Javits or something like that. It was kind of the equivalent of that, but for men's fashion, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I went to FIT, uh, and for those who are not, FIT is Fashion Institute of Technology, so that's a, a college here in New York City. So I went to FIT. And I was definitely familiar with the Magic Show, uh, and one of my close friends used to go there every year. Kind of did the same routine that uh, the FUBU dudes did, which is not necessarily have enough money to pay for their own booth and for orders, uh, and but would go there to still make connections and you know go in a hallway and cut a deal, <laughs> something like that, instead of having your own booth or something like that, right? Uh, so in FUBU's case, they would go out there. Um, and and essentially use their hotel room as their display room and and, and show for, showcase uh, for their product. So go to the convention and say, hey, we don't have a table here, but we got this room <laughs> uh, with all of our clothing here and, and so forth. So coming from the mag magic convention, they left. I believe it was about a um, million dollars in orders of orders that they had uh, received while they were at the convention. But they didn't have a way to fill out to fill fulfill the orders for their clients, right? So, uh, I guess in a sense, if we was to relate that to um, to tech nowadays, they had an MVP, but then didn't know how to uh, <laughs> how to really uh, scale it after that, right? So they come back to right. New York, um, trying to get funding. They got turned down by a lot of banks and 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 organizations to get a loan to fulfill the orders. And then ultimately, it was Damon John's mother who came up with the idea and said, hey, let's put uh, this ad in the New York Times to see if we can get finance. And then essentially the ad said, hey, I think it said have, they have a million dollars in orders, uh, but they need help with fulfilling the orders, All right? Um, and, and that's essentially what happened. And then out of, they got a lot of hits, but most of them were loan sharks, which yeah, that tracks. That would make sense. So they had a whole bunch of loan sharks, but uh, that kind of was hitting them up, trying to offer them money. But uh, one of the leads were were from Samsung, Samsung Textiles. So they cut a deal with Samsung Textiles uh, for the FUBU clothing to help distribute and manufacture the clothing. Um, I think the deal was that FUBU had to sell upwards of three to five million within the first 36 months or something like that. Uh, and they exceeded that within like the first six months. And then after that, I guess kind of the rest was, as they say, become was history. Right. Now, didn't the mom also uh, mortgage the house to finance some of the manufacturing? Yeah, for yeah the mm -hmm. that too. Yeah. So the mom definitely mortgaged the house at a certain point at one point to uh yeah to help out they they gutted her house one <laughs> they gutted her house they basically turned uh her house into uh the factory where they were making clothes they set up shop they had sewing machines they hired some seamstress uh to come through and and manufacture a lot of the clothes as well so the mom was actually a very uh, vital uh uh influence and help to the to the startup and the success of the business right 
Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the house became, like you said, it became the factory and it became the warehouse for storing, um, <laughs> right, right. storing the item. And also living, because they were still living there. They just had to figure out how to make it a living and work uh, dwelling at the same time. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, it came to me. Magic, Men's Apparel, Apparel Guild in California. That's what it stands for. Even oh, though, California, even, okay. Even though the event is always in Vegas. So, <laughs> go figure. All right. All right, so, boom. All right, so, I, and I think that's when, you know, for all intents and purposes, when FUBU was the FUBU that we all come to know it as during its heyday, right? Yeah, that was at, it, in this, like, you know, when it, be, it was the most culturally relevant, sure. Right, right. So, you know, and doing the research, I will say it's funny, I didn't even know Samsung did textiles. I'm thinking Samsung just does technology, which is what we all know them for. So to know that they had... Uh, hands in other businesses was also interesting as in, in its own right, uh, and that they were the one to partner with Fubu to get uh, dis to help distribute uh, the and fulfill the orders that they had. Um, so yeah, so now they're up on the scene, they're blowing up, and then you know um, I think well, hold on, I'm sorry, we're skipping a few key elements as well. We can't dismiss uh, the partnerships that they had with some of the key hip hop celebrities and a lot of the guerrilla marketing that they was doing prior to that, right? Um, well, yeah, they have one of the most famous guerrilla marketing stories in the history, right? <laughs> of all time. So, you want to get into that, Sean? Uh, I do, but but I feel like do we we talked about the t-shirts, but I don't know if we talked about uh the style of it. I guess. All right, yeah, let's talk. Like let's talk about and one. Yeah, let's talk about the style of it. Go for it. Well, because I know it's in right now what we would call it like memes or something, but they kind of would take something culturally relevant at the time mm -hmm. and make a t-shirt out of it. So like Free Tyson, when Tyson was in jail, or they made a shirt based on the Rodney King beat and like something about that. And that, you know, it was very culturally relevant right. um, apparel. So I think that was just a big part of their like branding and what set, set them apart. Well, fair, but I also feel like that was the early on before they were FUBU FUBU. Like, those t-shirts wasn't really under the FUBU umbrella that we've come to know it as, right? That's uh, facts, yeah. yeah, yeah it yeah. wasn't, I just think it speaks to kind of like their, uh, where they found their niche, right? What kind of... Um, right, got it. Yeah, what kind What kind of urban streetwear, yeah, how right. they found their foothold in there. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. And I, and I think, um, as we say as we speak to that also what was also interesting is that early on a lot of their sales and orders were from like um other countries and from like grunge skater communities it wasn't initially from the hip-hop community at first which was very surprising right. to to me and to them when they first started getting a big orders and stuff right Right. Yeah, that was a big shock how that culture was kind of like um, embraced in other different communities. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so, OK, I just want to make sure we talk, talked about the early T-shirts and then the marketing, you know, and it, it, a lot of this success also had to do with the, uh, I say, their clothes going viral, for lack of a better word, right? Like Damon John and the rest of the FUBU uh, founders would be at the video shoots, the hip hop music video shoots, and just giving out clothes. But it was different because nowadays everyone could get free clothes and free product placement nowadays, right? You have a whole bunch of people that's ready to just give out free clothing whenever they can and just for some free support and promotion. But they were going to the sets, giving out the free clothes but then taking it back and going to the next video shoot to use the same clothes for a different artist because they didn't have a lot of free swag and merchandise to give away like that, right? Yeah, the idea was just for them to be in the public eye as much as possible. Right, and I, I would also say, you know, this I'm really going to date and age myself at this point. I remember back in the day when the way to get put on was to be at these video shoots. It and regardless of what you were or what your skill set was. So if you were a rapper trying to get on, you would go to another rapper's video set and just spit for other executives. If you were a dancer, you would just show up, right? So in this case they were they weren't rappers, they weren't dancers, but they would go to the shoots and be like, Hey, we, we're part of wear this and, you know, part of the wardrobe crew or whatnot and get these artists to um, wear it and just keep promoting it and going and take those clothes back and go to the next set, right? Right. Yeah. So let's talk about the LL Cool J connection. Right. So 
the Gap commercial that well, cost millions of dollars, right? Is that where we're going with this? Well, we can we can get to that, but we can get to a little bit before that, you know, because Damon, Damon, and and the rest of the Fubu found the Fubu founders as a whole is from Queens, same neighborhood that LL Cool J grew up in, so they knew him, their childhood friends, uh, and Damon was trying to get some sort of celebrity endorsement or promotion, uh, and as he initially said. Uh, he he went to LL so that LL can introduce him to like Russell Simmons and so forth. You know, Russell Simmons had Def Jam and had Fat Farm and all his other endeavors. And LL had gave him some advice like, hey, if you want to get in their face and, and get them to help you out, you got to like stalk them and, 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 and be all up in their face and can't take no for an answer. And Damon was like, uh, well, LL wasn't going to give them, wasn't going to give them uh, the address to Russell Simmons and Andre Harrell. And so he's like, I didn't know how to stalk them, but I knew where LL lived at, so I just stalked him instead in order for him to uh, promote and uh, you know endorse the brand, which LL did. I will say, for me, at from at least for me, Fubu and LL were like hand in hand, at least in my memory. That's how I remember it. Yeah, they were definitely synonymous with each other back then, for yeah. sure. Right, like every time, every time I saw LL, he had some Fubu on, and it just kind of. Honestly, I just thought he had a stake in the business at that point, the way uh, he kept promoting it like that, right? And normally in 2023, they would, right? That would be the case, but this was just like kind of... Yeah. Like a little bit. In 2023, that would be the case, or at least a huge endorsement check. But back in the day, I don't think, you know, we, we didn't really know the, the power of the business and the coach and the clothing, so we just was like, you know, they're just together. And, and Ella just was always rocking it. Which led to the infamous uh, guerrilla campaign for the clothing, right? Uh, I mean, so the context for the audience is uh, Gap hired LL Cool J to do uh, acapella, uh, acapella. Acapella. <laughs> acapella. <laughs> <laughs> I had like Rockefeller. You had a, you was you was remixing words, okay? Yeah. Um, Go uh, Gap hired LL Cool J to do a freestyle rap. Mm -hmm. Um, in one of the commercials, it was a big campaign for them. G A P gritty, ready to go for us, by us on the low. G, that's for getting the A for always. P, that's for power and the people that praise backwards. P for popular, A for attitude. G, get it going, Daddy Gap is on the move. And you know it got them a lot of attention, but what they didn't realize was that A. LL Cool J was wearing a FUBU hat throughout mm -hmm. the whole thing, so mm -hmm. it was free branding and promotion for them, but also the lyrics he uses in the commercial yeah. literally reference FUBU. He said, for us, by us. On the low, stuff. right. Yep. For us, by us, on the low. Um, which was kind of crazy in, in hindsight. I'm, I, not even in hindsight. I, I was, not even in hindsight. Not even in hindsight. When it like happened, crazy. yes, when it happened, even... I was like, this is crazy. Um, yeah, because I remember when I saw it for the first time. Uh, and that, that memory burnt in my brain because, one, I was, I definitely didn't know much about business. I didn't know as much as I know now. But I knew that that wasn't right. <laughs> I was like, some somebody messed up here. I definitely was like, somebody did not do their due diligence. Because when the commercial first started, uh, I saw the FUBU hat. I was like, hmm. This is a Gap commercial. At first, I thought it was a FUBU commercial, actually, because he had the FUBU hat on and he was rapping, right? And then I was like, oh, Well, this... FUBU was the most identifiable brand in that commercial right. because of the hat right. and the lyric. And, and the lyrics. And, you know, you probably know this. Because at the time, people assumed that they could go buy FUBU at Gap stores. So, like, it really, like, right. that's how they caught on, I believe. You right. Know, that's how yeah, you still didn't realize the campaign ran for weeks, and <laughs> <laughs> they had no idea what was going on until they kept getting calls, like, right? Like Fubu at their stores, so. right? Right, and but I think when that commercial was over, and when he said for us, by us on the low, I said, Oh, I was like, This doesn't, this somebody, somebody did something, or somebody didn't do something, they, they didn't do their due diligence. And as you said, uh, Gap got hit with all these inquiries about where they can buy the FUBU hat and then someone at the Gap realized what happened and my understanding was that a lot of people got fired after that as well uh, and then the commercial was pulled uh, but by that point I mean over 30 to 50k was already spent on the commercial and the campaign and uh, it didn't do what it was supposed to do for the Gap but it definitely did what it was supposed to do for FUBU at the time right I mean I'd argue it did what it was supposed to do for Gap too because people were talking about Gap and it gave them kind of like some notoriety, not notoriety, be some visibility in the urban community. Like, they eh, were, 
You don't think so? No, no, listen, see, well, this this goes into a whole different philosophy. I don't think I'm not of the of the uh, thought that all publicity is good publicity. I can't, at least for me, I was I was the core demographic. I didn't want to all of a sudden go buy Gap clothes. I was more I was more personally more hype. Like, oh snap, they snuck that in and nobody caught it. And then for me, it was more like, oh, this is this culture and, and the language and how we speak is is very codified, right? Um, but it didn't make me say, hey, let me go to the Gap and buy some of their gear. I I was more like, ha. Huh. Somebody tried to leverage the culture and and didn't really know what they were doing. No, I agree with you that it didn't have. I don't think it had a one to one effect where people were going out to buy Gap jeans and uh, <laughs> yeah, <Yarrow. laughs> nah, you're right. Um, but I do think that we were like more aware of the Gap than we ever were before. Even if we weren't co- becoming consumers, fair enough. That, that awareness of the brand, we were we knew who they were. Whereas, like, I don't even know if I was really that aware of Gap before that. Yeah, gr- granted, they had their. They had their commercials, but they never had a commercial targeted to this community before. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now I'm kind of aware of them, Fair even enough. if you're not going to buy it. So. And all the things we got to give context, cause, because at that time, LL was was LL. Like, he had the sitcom. He had the albums. Like, LL was, like, peak, peak. You know, you couldn't really. He was. He, yeah. He, his presence was everywhere. He was the sitcom, the movies, and he was still active in on the music scene. So you couldn't get a bigger cosign than that at the time, you know? Yeah, for sure. And then uh, we see, you know, um, other artists obviously started embracing it and, and other celebrities. Um, and then somewhere along the line, um, you know, an album came out. <laughs> Fubu put out an album. Do you remember that album? I do. I believe, like, Fatty Girl was on that album. Oh, Fatty right? Girl. Yeah. <laughs> So they talk about that a lot, which which I'm always I always laugh about that era because, um, well I, I did like Fatty Girl, but I do remember thinking, why why are they doing a rap album? Why why are they putting out an album in the first place? Right? It just seemed very um, I don't know. It didn't seem to match the direction of I guess what I assumed the clothing line or clothing company would do, but. I mean, when you're on top of the world and you winning like that, I guess you could do whatever you want, right? Yeah, I feel like that was a time where everybody was kind of coming up with albums, all <laughs> genres of entertainment that broke through into the mainstream, thought they could come out with album. Like, I know, like, wrestling, they had an album. Mm-hmm. And, like, it was like, I don't want to say American Gladiator. You, you're the American Gladiator. Uh, so you know better than me. <laughs> Maybe it was them, but one of those TV shows right, right. had an album. So. Right, right. Everyone did have an album at the time, but I do remember Damon John saying, uh, uh, saying like, that was the point where it was like, all right, we're doing too much because they put out the album. I think they lost like they lost a lot of money on that album. Then it didn't, it kind of, it really didn't make any sense. And you know, it was like we're doing too much. We're like oversaturated now. The brand is, you know, they're just doing a lot, and it's not adding to the overall quality of the brand or the clothing. You know, um, which is funny because. You know, I like I liked Fubu, but I I can say I didn't necessarily love the clothes or felt like I wanted to buy the clothes. But I I always liked their success and I always liked their story. You know, even in the heyday, I, I just like seeing them shine and, and and win. But the style and the clothing was not necessarily something I gravitated to. All right, so you you brought up the word oversaturation, mm-hmm. and I think that's kind of, and I may be skipping a step, no, but, go for it. but I think the next kind of thing that happened for them was their retail distribution, right? They mm-hmm. were in Macy's and stores like that selling the product, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, um, so it got to the point where they had too much product, and the licensing deals was getting a little crazy. They had the shoes, they had the socks, they had the sneakers. On top of their clothing, uh, then the jackets, and then I um, remember they had like the Fat Albert collection. The Fat Albert collection had the streets on fire, though. I'm not even gonna like <laughs> people was copping that yeah. Fat Albert collection. But then what you started note, and then they remember they had the Muhammad Ali collection. And what I think started happening was that you know essentially it was too much product, and now you're starting to see it at the discount bins at at certain stores and, and whatnot. And you know it just really kind of was like well. You know the thing about things from uh, the culture, or from our the hip hop culture, is that no matter how cool it is, once the hip hop culture says it's not cool anymore, then it's pretty much a quick nosedive from there. You know, like 
the rest of the community or the mainstream culture looks at a lot of what we do to see, oh, well, is this is this cool or not, right? And then once FUBU was like, we're not really messing with it like that, it kind of took a, a, a little bit of a hit on the reputation and just the uh, the coolness factor of what it is and what it was. I mean, yeah, is, is that kind of, is it due to the availability of it, right? It went from being an urban kind of dangerous street brand to I have to go cop it at Macy's. You know, <laughs> is that part of the uh, for those reasons, or is that part of the growth? Like you got to be able to contribute to a mass audience. You got and- to. It, it's that's the catch twenty two. Like you got to grow, right? So if you're gonna grow, obviously you can't grow if you're in a community, uh, specifically targeting a community and group that at a certain level we we cap off. That's just the facts of the matter, right? We cap off at a certain Point. So either you're gonna grow, or you're gonna have to create it, keep creating new uh, products or services for the next wave to remain fresh. And um, they didn't necessarily do that. It kind of just, it's like I think at the height it was over three hundred and fifty million in sales, and then to now you can pick it up in a bin somewhere at, at Marshalls or or Kohl's right. or whatever, right? Um, and now I think that was a business mistake, right? Just if we talk about. They and I don't know I don't know the granular of it, but they somewhere along the line created too many products, right? They had too much uh, inventory, right, right. and it didn't it didn't reach the demand, and then so as a result, these stores were selling them off to the discount stores. <laughs> right. You get Fubu in your bargain basement stores, so it really hurt the mm-hmm. reputation of the brand. It definitely did, you know. It definitely did, but you know, one thing that I I really have to give kudos and props to the Fubu founders. Uh, uh, for is that a lot of times that would signal the death of the company as a whole, right? And that wasn't necessarily the case with them. Um, they may have just disappeared from our conscious, uh, but they just kind of basically closed up shop in America and then went overseas, right? Um, basically selling in other markets. You know, the U.S. market wasn't really filling them like that and selling them. So then they just went on a, basically a bunch of acquisitions. I didn't know that they owned Drunken Monkey. Um, and I didn't know that they owned Kooji. And Kooji, Kooji was a big surprise because Kooji, Kooji was the next wave, right? Kooji, everyone wanted the Kooji sweater. I had no idea that FUBU, you know, brought own that and acquire that so either, yeah. so for me i mean it, it was a few other brands that they had acquired along the way so um you know maybe the fubu brand as we know it wasn't popping and cool like that before but they had made some key acquisitions and partnerships so the company as a whole was still uh productive uh and profitable and, and still doing their thing it wasn't it really wasn't a story of, oh they was on top and then they fell all the way off it was just hey we created this product it was hot. It's not as hot as it used to, but as a business, overall, we're still around. We're just doing other things that you might not be aware of. Right, exactly. Right. And then I think that's part of what makes Damon John specifically such a good businessman is that he's able to like adapt to the environment. And you know, he, you know, the business never was in the red as far as I know. Right. Right. After, right. after they hit that level of success, they stayed successful in different realms and different ways, but they never, you know, they never went spiraling out of control. So. Right. It, it wasn't, you know, we'll, I don't think we'll ever see like the rise and fall of them, you know. Oh, Maybe if somebody wants a clickbait headline. If they want yeah, a clickbait they headline. Really right. Yeah. They have like the rise and fall. But, and I mean, at least from our perspective, it's not like they fell, fell. They just changed lanes and still remain successful in the other lanes. And even, you know, the other members, of of the other founders, you know, I I was reading up and listening to a few articles and interviews with them, and all of them are still doing their own thing in their own right, still successful, uh, and they're still all running FUBU together in some capacity together, which is which I think is also good as well. So I know we've been focusing on FUBU, but I gotta ask, you know, were there any other? Because this is when FUBU was out here. This was the time when a lot of street where brands was out and um you know making their run and and just you know i I feel like at least i I can name at least 15 brands off the top of my head that was out during this time as well um were you a fubu wearer were you a uh or more aligned to other brands during this time 
I don't want to call myself a fubu wearer. Oh. So I so I I was like grade school. I was in private school, so I had a uniform. Okay. From Monday through Friday. Okay. So I, my gear wasn't even that extensive. <laughs> okay. Age, fair enough. Fair enough. I did have a fubu jersey, and I think everyone had a fubu jersey at some point. I had uh, I think I had two. I had a red one. Um, and I had like a yellow and, and a blue one. So okay. yeah, I did have some FUBU jerseys, but I didn't have anything else really. Cool, cool. Um, so yeah, I I didn't have any FUBU. And I'm not even saying, that's, it's not to be like I was too cool for FUBU. I just, I didn't have any FUBU. Um, now this might, this is also probably gonna sound like a hater comment by me as well. Um, I didn't like that FUBU logo. <laughs> I, I didn't like the FUBU logo. It's too I, cursive for you? The, what about I'm, it? I'm talking about the FB one. The FB one that used to be together. Uh, oh, like okay. the hammering. It just, you know, maybe because I'm, I'm a designer and illustrator and all that. But it was something about that that I was like, nah, it just, sometimes things either hit me and I like it or it just does not work for me. And I'm not hating on it and I wasn't mad at it. I was just like, mm, this doesn't work for me, right? Uh but I like I always said I always liked and appreciated their success and them blowing up. But it it wasn't working for me. But there were other brands during that time that I used to rock a lot. Uh, there's this one brand. I, matter of fact, I should look them up and, and see what they up to. It was this brand called School of Hard Knocks. Oh my goodness, I used to. Rock. I had that. No, I used I to rock. Really cool oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it was about about that. This, their designs, their style, that little character. They had a. a a cartoon character that used to rock a fitted with no you couldn't see his eye. I don't know what it was about those designs. School of Hard Knocks was definitely my streetwear brand uh during that era, during that heyday. Um yeah, yeah I definitely had more of that than anything else. Okay, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> but now now you you're you I don't want to go on no too big of a tangent. You mentioned <laughs> Fat Albert and uh -huh. the and the licensing and all that earlier. Right. Didn't Fat Farm have a cartoon character deal too fat farm no? fat i don't know if it was fat farm or south pole i know south pole had south pole had licenses for the warner brother characters i do remember that okay. they had the bugs bunny fat farm um i know fat farm had their own mascot i'm not sure if they had a licensing deal with um with any characters uh because i remember having a fat albert some fab or sneakers back in high school. Oh wow! But I, swore, but I don't remember them being food, but maybe that maybe the brand it wasn't just that prominent. Right, it's it's remember. possible. It's totally possible. Um, because you know the streets was flooded, and that's another thing I'm I have to give Fubu credit too, because it wasn't like Fubu was one of one, right? Like Fubu was one of many, and they were just the most prominent and dominant out of all of them, right? And Right. from from all instances and 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 recounts of the story they just they just grinded and worked hard to ensure that they were uh you know the top out here and and trying to make it happen and, and made those strategic uh, connections and collaborations throughout the game um but i would also say the influence of fubu definitely can't be understated as well um i was you know personally i think i during that time i designed at least 10 different logos for people <laughs> in my neighborhood who all wanted to do their own version of a FUBU clothing line. Easily, mm, okay. easily, you know. And then I was I was a kid and just, you know, I was drawing and it's like, oh, I need a logo, I need a logo. So at least 10 different people who had their own version of their own clothing line that they wanted to do similar to FUBU. So I think once you, can, once you saw that, you know, FUBU was really out here and doing it and, and more prominent in our face, um, it, it inspired a lot of other people to say, "Hey, maybe I can I, I can do this too." And it doesn't necessarily just need to be music or sports or, or something like that, you know? Because cause there was brands before Fubu. I used to like Carl Kanai. I don't. I'm, I'm really digging in the crates with that one. Um, you know Carl Kanai? I know him. I remember him. I never. I never owned. Yeah, him. I used to like Carl Kanai. It was light because of the uniform. So it didn't. Oh yeah. <laughs> it <didn't> <laughs> My bad, Sean. I'm bringing up all your <laughs> like nah. Yeah, hitting with all the childish romps, like nah. <laughs> so but, yeah, um, it was Fat Farm, it was Fubu, and then uh, oh yeah, Rockaway. That was it. Rockaway. Rockaway. Okay, I feel like Rockaway was was. Uh, I feel like Rockaway came a little 
they kind of came on a little bit after Fubu's heyday. I don't know. Yeah, they were like ninety nine. Yeah, I they came into yeah, yeah towards end. But you know, like I said, um, it was a lot out there. You know, and Fubu, I definitely, again, Fubu gear and clothes was was totally fine. It, I didn't I didn't hate on it. Just as like uh, not really me. But you know, from a business perspective, I I definitely appreciate it. Uh, how they were moving even back then when I didn't even really know what business was and what it was about and how they moved I definitely liked there was something about them that I was like I like how they're moving um for sure so now uh you know they are um from my understanding they're relaunching and and things like that and I know I don't know how you feel about nostalgia brands or when you know things in the past say hey we're relaunching and, and make these type of announcements Personally, I just think it, it's never going to really live up to the to the excitement that it once was in the past, right? Um, no. Which, yeah, which I think is it's, it's it's expected. I don't necessarily know what the future holds for FUBU and the, you know and what they're going to do when they relaunch. But I, I'll say this, you know, just from where they started to see where all their respective careers is at, like you know, Damon John is on Shark Tank. Uh, the other one of the other brothers is uh, is a real estate and you know and the other one has a consultant firm and they still get together to do work together for Fubu. Uh, that alone to me is is worthy of uh, you know being c- commended for seriously because business as much as we cover business and we talk about the failure rates and and not just the failure rates a lot of the infighting and challenges that have to go. Uh, uh, that that's involved, and for four people to still do that and still remain cool after all these years, to me is is quite commendable. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, and so yeah. So, any other parting thoughts or considerations for Fubu, sir? Uh, one last thing. Did you see the Atlanta episode? Uh, Fubu, have you seen that? Episode? Oh, dog, that's good. Good one. I did see it. I did see it. That was a good one. Okay. It didn't even. Yeah, resonate. that was a good one. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That's all. I just was kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love that episode. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, wow, that was a good callback. I forgot all about that. You, that was a good episode, and a good callback because Fubu was. Uh, and for and I feel like we got to go into it now. Hold on, we thought he's gonna end, but we got to do it. spark notes. All right, so uh, it's a it's a flashback episode of a show Atlanta with Donald Glover, um, mm-hmm. and they go back to them in school where we were kind of talking about the merchandising and how they would find Fubu stuff in the bargain basement uh, mm-hmm. section. So they were in a discount store. Earn found a FUBU jersey in the discount store and his mom bought it for him but there was some speculation when he got to school whether it was fake or not right and yes and then the whole episode of of oh also wasn't it someone else that had a FUBU jersey as well they had a very it was it's identical the, yes like it was piece, yes on the bottom yes there. yes yes and so essentially the it was you know trying to figure out who had a who FUBU was fake and who was it right uh man i felt the pressure on that episode because i remember that was a good episode <laughs> man like you could yeah you really felt the pressure That's a i felt the pressure because i know back in the day you definitely had the pressure though just the whole notion of who had quote unquote real clothes clothes and not uh was was quite the social spectacle when you think about it right but that was a good episode yeah. i thank you for bringing that up thank you for bringing that up but i think it also i have a theory on that on that episode anyway I felt like both shirts was real, but similar to what we just said about the saturation of the of the clothing and the brand at that time, you know, you you found it in the bargain bin. One kid found it in the bargain bin. The other kid was like, my mom brought this in, or parents brought this and paid X amount of dollars. Honestly, I just felt like both of them were real, but it also spoke to what was happening to the brand as a whole at the time. That's an interesting theory. I never thought that they would both be real, but that makes a lot of sense, especially now that we're talking about the business side of it. Yeah, yeah they probably just had heavy inventory, like, all right, let's switch it up, put this patch on this one, and maybe this line will sell. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's all... <laughs> I, 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 that was my thought. Uh, and it was, this is way before we even did this episode. I remember watching the episode. I was like, I think they're both real. Cause, but I definitely remember... At least in my school, because we didn't have uniforms. In my school, there was so much focus on who had the real polo and who didn't have the real not polo or the guest or whatever brand was popping at the time. And we had all these and we had all these little tests to verify if the if clothing was quote unquote real or not. But then, especially when I started going to FIT and even a little bit before that, you start going more into these stores. You're like, there's so much variation with these brands. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. 
Unless it's like a glaring where the Jumpman logo looks like instead of Jordan jumping and dunking, he looks like he's playing handball or something. It's, right. it's, very, it's very hard. It, it could be very hard. And we're kids trying to be like, nah, that's, I don't know. But anyway, that's my little conspiracy theory on that episode. But thank you. No, nah, that's that. not even conspiracy theory. Yeah. That's a very valid theory that we kind of uh, supported with some evidence in our episodes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But thank you for bringing that up because I forgot all about that. That was a good one. All right, so that's a wrap on this week's episode about the start and rise of FUBU. Hopefully it provided you with some value and inspiration as you navigate through your business journey and personal life. As always, if you have any questions you would like us to answer on the show, shoot us a message on any of our social media channels. Also, don't forget to subscribe and share on Spotify and iTunes. See you again soon. In the meantime, keep riding. The Business Grind is for entertainment purposes. Opinions expressed are those solely of the host and guests. Please consult with a professional and exercise discretion before engaging in any business endeavors. I'm out here on the grind. I'm out here on the grind.